do that. Well, yeah. Last summer around fun. I, actually, I made two of those just one day. I got really interested into this. Uh, what you need is a good lathe and be very careful with your fingers. Uh, so when you turn those, this is something you turn. This is maple. Uh, put it on a lathe, turn it. Add this cute little uh, thing to make sure that the top doesn't get broken. Uh, this part of the bassoon you can also produce those on a lathe. You see there is a little mount here to uh, come the keys. So what you do, you, you, you turn this and you leave the sort of ring that you take up with the plane later. This is a little harder to make. This you need a plane. You turn only these two parts here and this becomes a sort of huge piece of wood that you will then smooth out with a plane. So it's part of planing and, and a rasp that kind of, kind of you know, tools you would use. This is completely unturnable, I should say. This has to be made out of a block of wood and just plain till you think you find the right dimensions. Because that's also one of the uh, characteristics of Baroque instrument making. They're all a little different. Uh, for instance, the two, these two instruments left from Mr. Eichentopf that I was telling you about, uh, they're very different. Their shapes, their dimensions. If you, if you now go to Heckel in Germany and buy one of these, you can buy 10 of them. They'll be absolutely to, to, to the nano micron. They'll be very, very similar. Uh, and I guess, you know, looking at all, the, all this beautiful furniture that people were making at this time, this is nothing. This is pretty, very, very simple. Very simple. And, and part of it was that, um, indeed, innovations in lathes themselves are leading to this greater ability. And if you think about the furniture, particularly the British furniture I showed you, um, the continental furniture, there's that really kind of remarkable t twisted, curved leg. It kind of goes, well, my bad drawing is there. But it kind of goes like this. Well, this is also an excitement of a new, new kinds of lathes that make that easier. So yeah. you think about the, kind of the, 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 the cultural things that have happened. You have different venues. Um, and in the Baroque book, they have, and then there are these great stories of, of um, Louis XIV, who actually liked to perform in, in yeah. a court, and he had these fantastic outfits, and so these extravaganzas. So you have the push to try to improve, to change these instruments. And you have the technologies that are shifting, um, and the way that the lathe itself is evolving to make all of these forms of woodworking more possible and that you've got someone with the skill, apparently, to do it. You have, and of course, the Louis XIV could have as many lanes as he wanted, but they were still, you know, not cheap things. Um, and so you have this convergence of all these, the, the need, the wish, the, um, and the venue. So um, I think there's a nice sort of convergence there, because if you think too about the furniture and the furnishings, they were part of this drama. They were part of bigger spaces, um, um, think of um, that film clips I had of you when I was at the BNA in the storage rooms, and there was this piece that had um, mirrors everywhere, and, and then there were pieces that had inlays of all kinds of ma materials like leather of pearl and different woods, woods from all around the world. And that's what I meant by the drama. That is also kind of the drama of, of these musical traditions that are evolving in particular ways. Um, I think the other part, um, is sort of, and it's this interest in, in, in making new things too. Um, so that's part of it too, I think, is the instrument, instrument workers, makers, and the ability. So how are these people trained, um, these music players, these direct musicians? Well, I think they were mostly, uh, you know, transmitting their knowledge from generations to generations. They were, you know, dynasties of composers, of musicians, and it was a trade. So they would buy the trade from, from their uh, father or uncle, and just you, you would buy the right to work for the, the colloquy, which was one of the orchestras that Louis XIV used to entertain. You would buy your right to be there, and then it would be employment, it would be tenure. 
<laughs> forever, and then you would have the freedom to go and you know invent whatever needed needed to be done for the pleasure of, of the king in the court. Um, one thing about the lathe, I had a friend who was a really hardcore early music freak, I should say, and he, he used a uh, foot powered lathe. Yes. And this looks like you know that has been on for thousands of years, like in all different civilizations. Um, it's amazing what you can do with those. I mean, he was a virtuoso. He would uh, uh, just, he had a sharp chisel, and he would just get this thing going, and it would turn the metal almost as fast as, as an electric one. And he would talk to me, and you know, the wood just would fly in the, in the room. Uh, you can do, you know, miracles when you, when you know what you're doing. And, and I just saw a uh, Milwaukee Art Museum, um, um, the conference I told you guys about um, two weeks ago, the American Ceramic Circle, and we had a very skilled um, ceramicist who was using the lathe um, idea, and she was talking about the way in which the lathe was brought into engine turning and ceramics, so the same thing. <coughs> you do your paddle, and then you've got this chisel, and you just sort of go in and out. You know? So there are all these different ways in which all, and this is all silent, this is all in the same time period, this new idea about why things look the way they do, because they go, wow, I can do this. Wow, this is new, right? Yeah. Or something else about that. So tell me about the church tradition real fast, because um, that's different than the court tradition, because a lot of our great composers were not in the court. They are other Mr. Bond. Yeah, well, they, they were, uh, I mean, uh, d depending where you lived, but right. if you lived, let's say, back to Versailles, for now, uh, there were two different jobs. There was the, the, the ballet in the pleasures of the king, uh, you know, entertainment, operas, ballet, comedy ballet, you know, all kinds of uh, big, big um, pieces in which the king often uh, was one of the big parts. Uh, but there was also the church composers, that was a completely different trade. Uh, so the, uh, something interesting for maybe you to know, we always take for granted that everybody's playing at the same pitch. If you go in anywhere in the world, pretty much now, you are going to be playing in Japan at 4, A equals 442. Here in the States, it's more like 440. But you could take your bassoon all over the world and play everywhere and just not having any problem with the pitch. That has been standardized. Mm -hmm. At that time, people would often play three different pitches, whether they would play with the organ in the church, or they would play chamber music, or they would play at the opera. So these people would travel with uh, a set of different length of joints. When I say joint, I say this, for instance. They would have a short one to play with the organ. They use always to make the organs sharper in pitch because they would shorten the pipes you know, to save on the lead, on the metal. And of course, immediately everything goes up. Uh, but to play chamber music, the instruments were designed to play sometimes a whole step or even a minor third for the ones who, that's a huge, huge interval. Uh, so you would spend your life between three different pitches and trying to accommodate, uh, you know, the best possible, I guess, uh, with, with all these different variations. That seems absolutely crazy to any modern performer. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's hard, to, hard enough now with the high standards we have of intonation to, um, to play, you know, in tune on one pitch, but playing, trying to play three would be, would be crazy. 